Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Florida Coastal School of Law LLM Programs Online Speaker Series. I'm Margaret Ioannidis, the Associate Dean of Strategy and Innovation here at Florida Coastal. We are so happy that all of you are able to join us from around the world. Um, we had a very large number of folks register for today's event, so we actually are recording today's event so that anybody who is not able to participate live is able to get a recording of the event as well. Um, before we get started with today's webinar, I wanted to just cover a couple of basic ground rules. Um, for everyone who's participating live, if you please mute the microphone at the top of your screen uh, until the end of the webinar when we have a live question and answer session, that would be great at decreasing any audio interference. Um, in addition, we are recording today's um, webinar for anyone who is not able to participate live. And also for those of you who are joining live, we will still send out a link to the recording as well as the slide deck from today's presentation as well. So hopefully you don't have to worry about taking too many notes during the course of the presentation. Um, during Professor Jenkins' presentation, if you do have questions, we encourage you to use the chat feature on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, you can send a message that goes out to everyone, or you can send a private message just to the presenters, in which case only I and Professor Jenkins will see those. Whether a question comes in through the chat feature or whether you reserve the question for the live Q&A at the end of today's webinar, we will do our best to answer all the questions that come in. Actually, Professor Jenkins will do his best to answer all the questions that come in. In addition, he's graciously offered um, to interact with anyone after today's webinar if you have questions that come to mind after the presentation, and we'll also provide his email address to everyone. So with, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started um, with today's presentation. Um, I'm the Associate Dean of Strategy and Innovation here at Florida Coastal School of Law. I oversee our three online LLM programs, uh, one in U.S. law, one in general law studies, and one in logistics and transportation. Um, and we, we thank everyone for participating today. I see a number of our students have registered for this event, as well as um, prospective students from around the world. So thank you for joining us. We are very honored to have Professor Jenkins as our guest speaker today. For those of you who are currently in the program, you may have already had the privilege of being in his class. He teaches both torts and evidence um, in our LLM program here at Florida Coastal School of Law. He also has been a professor for seven years at Charlotte School of Law, and prior to that, um, practiced law actually for 20 years in Raleigh, North Carolina, where he concentrated in the areas of medical negligence, products liability, wrongful death, and serious personal injury. Uh, he also has taught as an adjunct professor at the University of North Carolina School of Law for 10 years. Uh, professor Jenkins holds a JD with honors from University of North Carolina School of Law, where he also served on the law review and was inducted into the order of the coif. He also holds an MPA, that's a master's in public administration with honors from North Carolina State University and a bachelor of arts in political science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In addition to being an outstanding professor, he has also authored various publications and participated in continuing legal education and other presentations. He has been actively involved in numerous professional organizations, including the North Carolina Bar Association, the North Carolina Bar Association Litigation Section Council, the North Carolina Advocates for Justice, where he actually served on the Board of Governors, and the Fourth Circuit Judicial Conference. So he is highly accomplished as a litigator and as a professor, and we're honored to have him here today to speak on the topic of depositions. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Professor Jenkins. Thank you, Margaret, and I welcome everyone. And uh, it is afternoon here in North Carolina from where I, I'm in my study at home uh, doing this presentation. So. Uh, I know we have folks in various parts of the country and the world, and it may not be afternoon where you are, but I welcome you and thank you for taking the time to uh, discuss a bit about depositions. Uh, as Margaret mentioned, I was a civil litigator for 20 years. Uh, I am now currently living what I think is my professional dream in being a full-time law professor. But as I tell my students in courts and civil procedure and others that kept classes that I teach that I try to bring to you uh, 
information that has been gleaned from years of experience. I'm, I'm not guessing about this or how it works. I lived this for many years. And most litigators will tell you, certainly civil litigators will tell you that depositions are probably the one aspect of practice in which you do that, which uh, draws most people to litigation in the first place. The advocacy components of litigation, the uh, working with witnesses, questioning, examining, cross-examining, uh, all that goes on in a trial in a courtroom is what draws so many people to litigation and let it, in a lot of civil litigation practices, you might try one or two cases a year. That was my experience uh, over time, occasionally three in a year. And depositions really give you the opportunity to do that question and answer process that is, as I said, what draws so many people into uh, litigation or gives them an interest in that area of practice in the first place. From my perspective, depositions are the, without a doubt, the most important part of the discovery process. All right, I'm getting some feedback that the sound is bad. We, I went to the mic to try to make that work. Let's see if we can make any kind of adjustment that would help that. Can someone is, is, is that any better, any, some, a little bit better? I will do my best to keep the, I am wearing the headset, will do my best to keep the microphone as close to my mouth as possible. Uh, and do, if um, the sound does start to fade again, let us know, we will work with it. All right, again, I, as I was saying, I, I, I believe, and I think many litigators would agree, Civil litigators would agree that depositions are the most important part of the discovery process, and uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, obviously, there are the written discovery uh, tools that the federal rules of evidence and, and state rules of evidence provide. And when I first started practice 25 plus years ago, I tended to, to heavily utilize interrogatories and requests for production. As I practiced over the course of two decades, I cut that down fairly significantly uh, because what I found is that a deposition obviously gives you the opportunity to get the answer directly from the witness, directly from the adversarial party, directly from the other side, or from a representative of the party if it's a corporation. What you get when you send interrogatories and requests for production, quite frankly, is an attorney's answer. You are going to, obviously, the defendant, and if you're from the plaintiff's side, or would have to answer the questions, but the answer that is put on paper most often is going to be, uh, it's going to come through the filter of the attorney representing that party, as it should. And so you can have difficulty, particularly with interrogatories, in getting answers to the more substantive questions. Interrogatories are great for identifying people, for quite frankly determining who you need to depose, uh, for finding out who has information. Requests for production are essential to getting the necessary documents, but in terms of digging into actually what happened and trying to develop the case on behalf of your client, there is no discovery tool uh, in my mind that comes anywhere close to being as, as important as depositions. And I, I took hundreds of depositions over my 20 plus years. I even had a couple of cases where the, the single case itself probably had close to 40 depositions. That tends to be uh, the exception, but there, and certainly now under the federal rules with limits on the number of people who can be deposed, but if it's a very involved case and perhaps one with many witnesses, then it can be uh, pretty extensive. So an incredibly important part of the discovery process, the deposition process is governed by the rules of civil procedure. There is some interplay with the rules of evidence. And certainly if you are taking the deposition to for the express purpose of playing it at trial instead of calling the witness live, I. Rule 30, the depositions by oral examination, that is the rule that we're focusing on and the, the application that we're focusing on. I do in Rule 29 highlight the stipulations component, um, and I do point out at the bottom of the slide that 
state, there may be some variation between the federal rules and the state rules in terms of what they permit as it relates to depositions. I highlighted the stipulation part of Rule 29 because the reality in, in my practice over the years was that so much of what is done related to depositions is done by agreement of the parties. And it just makes sense that um, both sides in a, uh, in a lawsuit, in a civil lawsuit, particularly one that may have some involved discovery, need the cooperation of each other in order to make it work, in order to um, move the process along. And so you certainly there can be situations where people are being difficult to deal with, they are stonewalling the process, but in my experience, most of the time, lawyers are doing and handling the deposition process through agreement and starting with a discovery scheduling order, which would be required under the rules, the parties would enter into a schedule for conducting discovery, for conducting written discovery and taking depositions. And then the court would enter that order and the parties would have to meet those deadlines in order to move the case forward. Um, I just pulled out at random a sample form schedule, scheduling order for discovery that appears in the United States District Court for the District of Kansas. Many uh, federal trial courts have examples of what they are looking for and in, in the District of Kansas, it gives you a summary of the various deadlines that you would have to meet. Again, we are dealing largely, we are dealing with depositions in this presentation, but the discovery scheduling order would set out deadlines for written discovery, for mediations, for uh, trial, and would also distinguish between fact witness and party depositions and depositions of expert witnesses, which we will, which we will talk about in just a few moments. Depositions, um, again, in terms of Rule 30, are governed by uh, the federal rules of evidence. And the court, uh, the rules do require leave of the court, a motion of the, to the court to proceed unless the parties have, if the parties have not stipulated to the deposition. And again, I, I can't recall a situation in 20 years of practice um, where I had to go to the court to be able to take a deposition of someone the other side knew and believed that I was entitled to depose. I did have a couple of situations in suing on behalf of, a, of an injured party, a corporate defendant. In one particular situation, I wanted to depose the uh, chief uh, executive officer of the corporation and um, the defendant opposed that and I had to go to court to get that ordered. But typically the parties know who is going to be deposed, understand that you have the right to take those depositions. And often, um, particularly as to fact witnesses, uh, your opposing counsel would want to depose those witnesses as well. Again, the federal rules now limit, uh, have a presumptive limit of 10 depositions, though again, that can be expanded by agreement of the parties or upon motion of the court, or to the court and the court granting that. Um, not all state rules have that limitation. I, there's no presumptive limitation in North Carolina, but so you need to be aware of that if you're in a state court practice as opposed to a federal practice, that there may not be a rule-based limitation. As we will discuss, there are some practical limitations, including costs of taking depositions that may limit the number you want to take, but federal rules uh, specifically have a presumptive limit. Again, it's not an absolute limit. You, at a deposition, you obviously want to have all the necessary documents with which to question the witness or witnesses. And so you would do an initial round of written discovery, particularly to get your, submit your requests for admissions to the other side. And you wanna make sure that you have all of the necessary documents before you go to depose the witness. Uh, it's very unusual to get two opportunities to depose a witness, so you need everything um, that you feel is important when you go. If you are deposing a non-party and you want documents, you will have to subpoena those documents from that party to ensure that they are produced. But if you're deposing a party, then the discovery process is what uh, you utilize and you do not have to subpoena 
documents from a party. But again, it's very important. Um, often there can be, or I had, well often, and certainly several times over the years in my practice, we had to delay a scheduled deposition because all of the documents had not been produced to me that I felt my client was entitled to obtain, or we had some type of um, motion to compel answers to interrogatories request for, or request for production that we wanted answered before we took a deposition. So again, getting the, part, the documents together is key before you go into a deposition. The rules also, Rule 30 also notes that uh, you can take a deposition by audio, which is the most common, uh, and stenographic means, or that you can video the deposition. And um, again, we will talk about some of the considerations related to whether you should video the deposition, it depends in part upon your client, perhaps. Maybe your client wants all depositions videoed but that is not required. You do have to, in noticing the deposition, which is sending the document to the other side, uh, stating the date and time the deposition will be taken. And again, that is done by agreement almost all the time. You would have to designate if you were going to uh, take the deposition by audiovisual means uh, for various reasons, including notifying opposing counsel and also, quite frankly, the witness being deposed might dress differently if they're going to be on uh, audio, I mean, videotaped as opposed to uh, simply there being a, a, a uh, transcript taken or audio being recorded. The rules also permit for depositions to be taken by telephone or other remote means. In most earliest years of my practice, if we took a deposition, uh, by remote means, it was by telephone. Now, obviously, there are numerous uh, platforms on which you can take depositions, and that does cut down at times on some of the expense of the travel associated with getting to those depositions. So the rules do permit that. Additionally, objections is, as it regards questions and depositions are under the rules supposed to be handled a bit differently. Obviously, there is no judge present to rule on an objection. And so the opposing party is supposed to state the objection, note the objection on the record, but then the examination, the question and answers are supposed to proceed. And I think technically under the rules, unless a privilege is involved, uh, the person should answer the question. Now, the reality is that does not always happen, but attorneys should be slow to instruct their client not to answer, particularly if you are uh, going beyond a privilege in terms of not answering. When I teach depositions in uh, skills classes to students, I note to them here that this is the difference between discoverability and admissibility. The fact that a, your client may have to answer a question in a deposition does not mean that that question will ever be asked in a courtroom or in a trial. It simply means that it is discoverable. Admissibility will, can be challenged and contested at the trial uh, in, in front of the trial judge. Uh, I will say that experienced litigators don't necessarily always limit their objections. Uh, objections in depositions can be used for various purposes. Uh, that All of the uh, strategy of that and us and bolts of that is probably beyond this presentation, but it is certainly uh, worth noting that uh, objecting and often when I teach deposition courses, the, the thing that just All concerns, attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. The um, students are often concerned about when do I object? Um, again, experienced litigators aren't so much concerned. And quite frankly, the best way to do that is just to observe depositions, to watch them and to take them and uh, there is a certain amount of uh, learning as you go that has to take place in that particular process. You also occasionally in, in, in getting your client ready for a deposition, you might want to note to them the difference between discoverability and admissibility. I have had after uh, depositions clients ask me why they had to ask a, answer a certain question that they did not want to answer. And I would have to tell them that is it is proper to be asked that question. We will fight about whether the jury can hear it when we get to trial. Additionally, the federal rules 
have a presumptive limitation on the duration of a single deposition. Um, so uh, one day of seven hours. I have issues question mark. Um, I very seldom, I was in depositions that, uh, uh, or in cases where we had two or three or four days in a row of depositions, but it was not a single witness. I have heard of single witnesses being deposed for three days straight. Um, I never had that particular situation, never felt like there was anything somebody else had to say or I needed to ask them that would require that much time. Again, the federal rules do have a presumptive limit that can be uh, changed by agreement of the parties or uh, by order of the court. Again, in terms of going or t attempting to go longer than seven hours, you run into issues of the costs associated with it. I always tell students when, as well that uh, the witness may get tired, but you may get tired. And if you as the questioning attorney, the examining attorney get tired, you may not do as good a job as necessary. So to the extent that you can get the deposition done, the vast, vast majority of depositions, I think, uh, can be completed in one day of seven hours. And then there are the question at the end about whether the witness will read and sign the deposition. Again, there are some state variations on this, but this is um, a way to get the witness after the deposition has been taken to read the transcript and to sign certifying that the transcript is true and accurate or to change answers if the rules so permit. And I always found is it a good idea to ask the opposing witness to read and sign so that you know you have a accurate uh, uh, stenographic copy of that witness's testimony. All right, so that, that was a quick look at some of, some of the uh, provisions in Rule 30 and a brief look at Rule 29 as it relates to depositions and, and what is permissible with depositions. I want to talk about some of the practical considerations and aspects of, of depositions that are not uh, necessarily covered by the rules, but are considerations that any litigator has to take into account. Cost is um, certainly a consideration. Again, in representing uh, companies, corporations and the like, they would be paying the costs and you might have to get approval for the depositions. Depositions can be expensive. They can run anywhere from four, five, six hundred dollars to two thousand dollars or more. If there is a, a video recording of the deposition, then it may add another seven, eight, nine hundred dollars, if not more. So you might have a deposition, a single deposition that could run you as high as you know two or three thousand dollars. And if you're having multiple depositions or if you're in a case where you're wanting to exceed the presumptive 10 deposition limit, then um, you may be looking at a significant cost. I, I use an example in some of my classes from a case that was in the United States District Court in the District of Minnesota. Um, it was a case involving the former governor of Minnesota, a guy named Jesse Ventura, who brought a defamation claim against uh, the subject of a movie called The American Sniper. And uh, if you could see from here, the deposition costs alone in that case exceeded 30000 dollars. Uh, there would be other costs. They may not be recoverable from the other side, but in a single case, uh, the depositions alone exceed $30,000, and that is in some litigation a significant consideration, again, depending upon who is paying the expenses. What I say, uh, advise uh, students and young lawyers, is you certainly should not be in a case if, if either you or your client can't afford to take the necessary depositions. And there would be certain depositions that would be necessary. Um, the question beyond that is, um, do you take every potential deposition or every potential deposition subject to the presumptive limit? Again, you can get into some cost issues and you have to make some decisions. Keep in mind as well, if, if the client you represent is paying you an hourly rate, they are also paying you for your time to prepare for, travel to, take the deposition and travel back from the deposition and then read and summarize it afterwards. So 
the cost I'm showing you here is simply the cost of obtaining transcripts and videos. There are also the attorney's fees costs associated with depositions. Part of a sort of intertwined with costs, but a, a also a separate consideration is who should be deposed. And you can break that up most typically into parties, to fact witnesses, and then into expert witnesses. So let's take a look at that. I never had a, a case, or at least a case of any significance, uh, where there were significant issues on the civil side where the, the opposing party was not deposed, and I never litigated against an attorney who did not depose my client. So uh, it can be a slightly different consideration if you are representing a corporate client, a corporate party, as to how many people within the corporation, depending upon the issue, need to be deposed. But it is, um, uh, I think, fairly safe to say that it is a given that you would depose the opposing party and that your client or clients, if you represent more than one person without conflict, would be, um, would be deposed. Fact witnesses can create a different issue. Uh, fact witnesses unaffiliated with Fact witnesses unaffiliated with, I'm sorry, I was pausing to read the uh, chat over here. Fact witnesses unaffiliated with one of the parties uh, can be, you can contact them. You can, you can speak with them uh, independently. And so you may not need to depose them if their testimony is crucial to developing your case and developing your strategy, then often you would depose the key fact witnesses uh, to, um, you would depose the key fact witnesses to get their testimony on the record so you know what you're dealing with. Um, if there was some concern that a fact witness might uh, leave the country, uh, perhaps in, in the military and leave the country or move or relocate, or if a fact witness was ill and there was concern about whether the witness would, would still be uh, either physically able or even alive to uh, be a witness at trial, then you might take their deposition. Uh, again, it's going to depend upon how you assess the importance of the fact witness and how extensively your client wants to be, or how extensive, how far your client wants to go in such, um, in taking such depositions. I also, I put um, uh, uh, various pictures. It, there can be situations where a fact witness is a child and uh, there are unique uh, considerations in both deposing a child or in calling a child as uh, as a witness at trial. And again, depending upon someone's age or physical condition, there can also be some issues associated there. So again, in my experience, key fact witnesses, witnesses whose testimony was clearly necessary at trial and whose testimony could turn the case uh, we almost universally deposed them, uh, and if it was really important, we might have um, we might have um, might might um, video it as well, right? Also, in terms of who sh should be deposed, you have the sequence of witnesses, um, and there sometimes is some strategy associated with that. Typically, in a case. Each side will, oppose, will depose the opposing party first and get that information on the record. That doesn't always happen, but it is certainly by far the most typical situation. And then you may have a question as to the sequence of witnesses, particularly if it is a group of fact witnesses. Uh, and what, you, what your consideration is there is you may want to, sorry, I need to go ahead yet. You may want to, um, you may need to depose a witness and get that witness's uh, testimony on the record before you depose a second or third witness if the first witness's testimony um, may raise some questions that you need to address with a subsequent witness. And uh, it's not always the case that you have to do uh, thoughtful sequencing of witnesses, but it is also not something you just want to do willy-nilly. Again, video. Um, as Margaret mentioned in the introduction, I did a fair amount of medical negligence litigation, 
and always, almost almost universally, always deposed the defendant doctor to have them on the uh, record and on the record not, not only from a transcript standpoint but from a uh, video standpoint. Again, a, a key witness, uh, you may want to video them. Uh, there is some thought that perhaps if you expect the witness may be difficult witness that you might want to video the witness that being on camera might uh, calm them down a bit, change their disposition. All of that is consideration. The other thing is we are talking principally about discovery depositions and, and taking a deposition under Rule 30 simply as part of the discovery process. You may also take a deposition for use at trial and in doing so, uh, certainly now, and imagine not videoing that deposition so that you could play the video of the witness's testimony at trial. So again, that would be the non-discovery process would be a video deposition of a witness who can't, for whatever reason, cannot attend the trial and you're wanting to play their, their deposition by video. Occasionally there can be an issue about who may attend a deposition. Even the parties under the rules are, are typically entitled to attend if they want, very seldom. In my experience, does a party want to attend a deposition? They tend to leave that to the attorneys. Um, but there's no, other than the parties, there's no absolute right for any other witness to attend a deposition. And so if you were deposing four or five different fact witnesses in a row on a single day, uh, you might sequester the uh, later witnesses and not allow them to hear the testimony of the earlier witnesses in order to make sure you're getting uh, nothing but their testimony as to testimony influenced by prior uh, depositions. And finally, expert witnesses. And expert witnesses have become a huge part of litigation in the United States. And the courts do not um, retain experts, or only in rare situations will the court retain experts or, des or appoint experts. The experts are uh, hired by the private litigants. And uh, if a, an opposing party has multiple experts designated, you have the issue as the attorney of should I depose one of them, all of them, or none of them. And um, again, a lot of that is strategy. Some of that comes with experience. It also depends on whether you're in state or federal court and um, whether there is a requirement of the expert to produce a written report. Federal courts require these require experts to produce written reports. Uh, in my home state of practice, North Carolina, the state courts do not require expert reports. And so for us, uh, other than interrogatories that again would be answered by the attorney representing the opposing side, the only way for us to get any information about an expert witness was to depose that expert. There's a cost consideration associated with deposing experts because you have to pay the expert for his or her time uh, while you are deposing them, whatever their hourly rate is, or if you want to challenge their hourly rate, to uh, um, ask the court to set an hourly rate. So um, the other thing, and I put um, an apple here with one bite out of it, if they're you have some strategy considerations if you are deposing more than one of the, the opposing party's experts. Attorneys will debate um, how, how much do I challenge this expert on his or her opinions. Um, and um, if you decide to, uh, you think you've got some good ammunition against an expert's opinion and you side, decide in a discovery deposition to go after that expert and to try to break him or her down uh, on their opinions and show the prop flaws with their opinions, to the extent the your opposing party has a second or a third expert uh, offering opinions about the same area, uh, the reality is you are not going to be able to break down the second or third witness. Once you break down the first witness, then your opposing counsel will know how to, where you're coming from, the direction you're taking, and how to uh, then prepare their witnesses for that, for those questions. So uh, some, some attorneys prefer just to get 
basic information from experts and saved all the challenges for trials. Other attorneys may challenge a particular expert if they feel that expert is vulnerable in a discovery deposition. The important thing about expert witnesses in deposing them is you need to take it step by step and get everything down about their opinions, everything down about what they relied upon so that you know then uh, what um, you have to work with when you're going to trial. There's, I noticed a question at the, and it would relate very specifically, I think, to expert witnesses. How can you make sure to narrow the issues for trial in a deposition without revealing your trial strategy? Um, often at the expert witness stage, um, you will have designated your experts and provided reports to the other side in federal court, and they will have done the same to you. And a lot of the trial strategy of your opposing counsel is going to be clear to you when you see where the experts are coming from with their written reports. Um, what I have found, what I found over the years is that given the involved nature of the discovery process, uh, it is a bit difficult to keep a full trial strategy uh, secret from the opposing side because it, uh, Good lawyers, experienced lawyers doing this kind of work are going to uh, be able to narrow down most of the time where you're going and what they anticipate you are to do. Um, there, there are situations where you can try to narrow the issues, for example, in deposing an expert if an expert has rendered five opinions. Uh, perhaps you can get the expert or, or um, challenge the expert on one or two of those opinions to the point of getting the expert to concede that perhaps they're not as important as uh, other opinions the expert has given. If you can get the expert to do that, and again, it would have to be, there'd have to be an opinion sort of on the margin or on the periphery that the expert was vulnerable in trying to support, then maybe you can narrow uh, the issues from five to three uh, based on what the expert, him or her, self says. Sometimes uh, it just in depositions what a party or a fact witness gives you that perhaps you don't anticipate they will say can, can change your trial strategy and that is just something you have to be aware of and ready to work with. Um, my approach in taking depositions over the years was largely to make sure I got all of the information that, that I could so that I could consider everything that might come up at trial and try to be prepared for it. Uh, one danger in if you try to limit a deposition in context of narrowing issues is then you may not be prepared at trial to deal with something that comes up. And the purpose of discovery depositions is to make sure that you are ready to uh, deal with, with whatever the other side may throw at you at trial. So again, you have lots of considerations. Early in my career, I often deposed almost all of the opposing side's experts. Uh, I had a few cases in the latter part of my private practice career before I started, uh, before I took my faculty position, where I had a couple of cases where I did not depose a single expert. And in fact, one of the um, most effective cross-examinations I ever did in a medical malpractice trial was of an expert witness whom I had not deposed. Uh, and just by not deposing him, he, in that sense, he had no idea how I was going to approach his testimony. I knew the case well enough to know what it was he was likely to say, and I was able to break him down at trial because he did he had not had a trial run with me asking him questions in a deposition. That's not going to happen every time, but that sometimes will happen. And again, uh, some of it depends upon in terms of how many experts you depose depends upon the wishes of your client. Another consideration to take into account in, in uh, depositions is client preparation. And you as an attorney uh, would have the obligation to prepare your client. And I will note, please note specifically, I'm not saying you have an obligation to tell your client what to say. I actually, over the course of 20 years, had uh, on more than one, one occasion, uh, a client asked me, 
how should I answer this particular question or that particular question? And my first response was always tell the truth. All right. So, um, and I hope that would always be your response as well. Tell the truth. Now you do, you can help the client decide how best to present that information, but you should never tell your client exactly Right, I'm, hang on one second and I will um, call in and see if I can get this sound better. Now that I, is that still, that's no better, Margaret? Is that, is that actually working? All right, should I go with this now then? Or should I call in? Go with this? All right, um, I think I was talking about the ethics of preparing a client. All right, and again, the client preparation is your absolute responsibility, but again, it is not to help your client change the facts, and I trust that none of you would ever do that. Don't ever cross that line. And, um, I'm getting a question about expert witnesses and previous depositions and the like. Let's hold that one to the end and I will do that as a general question at the end and uh, bring it back up if I fail to uh, remember it's there. So the first thing I would always tell a client is that it is not a conversation, all right? That most good litigators will try All to attendees put, are muted. All attendees most, are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. Most good litigators will try to put the person whom they are deposing at ease um, so that hopefully then they drop their guard and, and um, who knows what they might say. And so always remind your client that it is not a conversation, no matter how nice the opposing attorney may be, he or she's job is to um, uh, win for their client and not for you. For your client, all right? I also is not unusual. I've represented mainly individuals. It may be different in the corporate context, but I've represented numerous individuals who um, would express the desire they couldn't wait to get into a deposition and tell the other side their case, tell the other side what happened. Uh, and I made it clear to them that, in my view, you really can't win your case in deposition, but you certainly can lose it, all right? And so, and that comes if you are talking too much, if you are offering a bunch of extraneous information, if you get defensive, all of those things can be a problem. So I always told clients, don't go in there thinking you can win your case, um, but if you get um, too verbose, you could lose your case. Again, if it's not being videotaped or, or videoed, uh, then I always tell clients, don't, don't hesitate to take your time to answer. Sometimes clients are worried about a pause. They, they say it makes them look like they're uncertain. No, we all need time to think. We all need time to reflect on occasion. Uh, and the answer to a particular question may not pop immediately into mind. It's okay to pause. And it's okay to pause even if there's the, the depositions being videoed. Uh, a lot of attorneys would start with number four, telling your client to ask, answer the question asked. That may seem elementary. But again, it is the lawyer's job on the other side to pull out the information. You don't want to be um, difficult, but you want to answer the question asked and not start offering uh, other extraneous information that is not related to the question asked. In fact, what I, I would be able to make it very basic to clients. Um, I would say if the opposing attorney asks you what color is the sky, you, you answer that the sky is blue. You don't need to start talking about a particular shade of blue or how many clouds are in the sky or how you like a, a evening sunset. You just need to say that the sky is blue. Uh, that usually, something very basic like that, usually got the point across. Um, you don't want clients to guess or speculate. And often clients feel like they have to, particularly somebody who's never been deposed before, feels like they have to answer every question. Now, somebody who's been deposed or uh, maybe somebody of a, um, you know, depending on their educational background and general experience background, 
may not be quite as vulnerable, but uh, often clients feel like, in my experience, feel like they, they had to answer every question. And sometimes you don't know. If you le legitimately can't remember the answer, uh, that is a perfect, perfectly acceptable response if it is true. You are not, nobody expects you to remember everything. Your line is now unmuted. Now, I'll, do you think that use this, I will take this question, you think that using an interpreter for your client to overcome their nervousness during the depot, certainly depending upon the, uh, the situation involved, um, I uh, represented uh, just a few people, probably less than five over the years, uh, where I had to utilize a, an interpreter in dealing with the client just on a on a day-to-day attorney attorney client basis. But certainly in in that particular context, that I would not hesitate to do that if it would uh, overcome nervousness and help the, help to better prepare the client. Again, just like saying, I, as I said before, many clients feel like they can't say, I don't know or I don't recall. And yet, if that is the honest answer, it is perfectly acceptable. Um, also, sometimes clients feel like they have to fill a silence. And so I always caution clients about that. For example, I know there were times when I was taking depositions when I might ask a question and then there might be a long pause before I asked a second question. And it was interesting to me how often during that long pause, the witness I was deposing would just start talking again. No question asked, no follow-up question, they would just start talking. They would get nervous by the silence, nervous by nothing being asked, right? And in all those situations, I was never, it was never gamesmanship on my part. Uh, usually I was sitting there trying to decide if I want to ask a follow-up question or in what direction I want to go next. And so I always cautioned all of my clients, if you have answered the question that the attorney has asked, then sit there and wait for the next question. Don't feel, if the attorney does not ask another question immediately, don't feel like you have to fill that silence. Number seven can be easier said than done for somebody who, uh, depending upon their background, it may be, uh, socioeconomic background, it may be, you know, ethnicity or language barriers that, that can create some nervousness. Uh, it may just, the process itself may create some nervousness to the, to the extent they can stay calm. And you're there with them, you'll be sitting there beside them. Uh, there was on more than one occasion over my years that I would reach over and just put my hand on my client's hand, uh, just as a signal to them to just be calm, uh, that everything would be all right. Again, your client will be assessed in the deposition. The other side will be looking at your client to say, what kind of witness will they make? How believable would they be at trial? And so you need to, to the, as best you can, work with them on that process. One way to do that is to walk them through some of the key questions you anticipate being asked. Ask them that, those questions as if, as if you are the opposing attorney and let them practice answering them, simply answering those tough questions uh, when, uh, when they're on the spot so that then when they get to the deposition, they're able to do so. You certainly want your clients to wait for you to finish your objections. If you object to a question, you don't want them blurting out an answer until you uh, finish your objection, particularly if the objection might involve a privilege, which would mean the client would not have, have to uh, answer. And then number 10 really should probably be number one, and that's tell the truth. Um, the truth will come out. Litigators uh, are in our system with the discovery process are great at getting to the truth. And so don't hide things, tell the truth. Again, you can help your client determine how best to present the truth, but ultimately if they fail to tell the truth, it will bite them. And so I always made it clear to them to tell the truth. All right, so how, the question, how often can a lawyer of the defendant pretend not to understand a question in order to allow the witness to, if I understand that question, you're asking can a, could a defense lawyer, if you were representing the plaintiff and deposing the defendant, 
Could the defendant's lawyer claim not to understand your question in order to either shield the client, his client, or give his client some time to think or pause? Um, what I would say to that is there are situations where even very experienced litigators ask bad questions, often because you're asking those questions on the fly um, and you're not reading them off of, a de off of an outline. And usually if it's a bad question, it is you can rectify it immediately and there's really nothing else for the defense counsel to or the opposing counsel to uh, complain about or to object to. Um, lawyers do on occasion object or interject uh, sometimes uh, to try to help their clients in a deposition. I don't think that's technically proper under the rules, but I will confess that almost every experience, well, you know, Every experienced litigator I know has done that on occasion. So, um, um, but there's only so much a lawyer can do uh, to truly protect a client in a deposition if you stay diligent about seeking answers to your question. Lawyers may try to sidetrack you or to get you to accept a non-answer, but if you stay diligent in seeking the answer, then you almost always will get an answer or the witness will look evasive. Is there a difference between hiding the truth and lying? Could I instruct my client not to mention all the details to safeguard his interest? I would say you cannot instruct your client not to mention all of the details if he or she is asked about those details, right? That goes back to like number six, don't fill the silence. Answer only the question asked. Um, if the lawyer taking the deposition uh, has a hole in his or her questioning that does not bring out information, then your client does not have to offer it. Uh, what your client cannot do is withhold information that would be the, a direct and honest answer to a question asked. So uh, I don't, in terms of directly hiding the truth, to me would be just as problematic as telling a direct lie, but again, I had, I did see situations over the years where attorneys simply did not ask the question. Often, often it's in follow-up. They will ask a preliminary question. The witness will answer, and then they will not ask the uh, what to me often seemed like the obvious follow-up question. Again, uh, I always told my clients those details will come out. And quite frankly, if your client has told you those details prior to the deposition. Uh, then uh, at a break or something, I would instruct my client to fill in the blanks if they had left blanks in the details because once you know the true facts, you can't sit idly by and watch your client or listen to your client fail to tell the truth. So there is a line between is the client hiding the information and has the lawyer asked for the information. If the lawyer taking the deposition has asked for that information, your client's going to have to answer it, going to have to give Remember, you can tell your client that's the difference in discoverability and admissibility. The fact that they answer the question doesn't mean it can be asked at trial. The final thing that I've told witnesses over and over, and I, including expert witnesses, is don't try to outsmart the lawyer asking you questions. This would apply both uh, in depositions and at trial, but I bring it up in depositions because this is what we're talking about. Um, Certainly in a deposition or at a trial, if I, if I was ever deposing someone or examining someone and cross-examining someone in trial who I felt like uh, was going to try to teach me a lesson, and often that was expert witnesses who were going to, you know, show me that they knew way more than I did about a medical or a technical issue. And I will tell you, I, would read, I will readily concede that all of those experts know more about medical issues or technical issues than I did but I might know as much about one narrow issue as they do based on my own preparation and research and um, uh, examination. And the other thing, the big difference is after a number of years of doing this, I ask questions for a living. And uh, if you're trying to teach me a lesson and trying to outsmart me, 
then odds are as a witness you're going to open the door to something because you're going to say something or exaggerate something and it's going to give me an opening then to uh, to um, truly cross-examine you in a way that, that may break down your testimony. So uh, clients often, too often ask, what kind of tricks is this lawyer going to try with me? And, and all the clients I ever represented, I told them that 99% of the questions the lawyers ask you, they're going to ask you those questions simply because they want to see how you're going to answer it. There's no trick to it. There's no nothing underhanded they can do. There's, there are a few things that lawyers can do to try to get deeper into the information they want, but they're just, in my view, there they're just aren't tricks that they can do. Uh, and quite frankly, they can't trick your client if your client is being truthful about their testimony. They, they won't be able to trick them because the truth will stand. Your preparation, in addition to preparing your client, then when you go to take a deposition, you have to be prepared. Um, there is no substitute in the law, in any area of the law, in my view, for preparation. And certainly in litigation, I think it is even heightened. You have to know the case. You have to know the issues. You have to know the other testimony in the case. You have to know the documents. You have to know the facts. Because then when you're questioning a witness in deposition, if you know all of that information, you can take their answers and ask follow-up questions that will lead you to obtain full information and to fully explore and establish their position on the case, whether it be a, a, a party or a fact witness. No substitute. Never think you can go in unprepared and do a good job for your client. Have a plan. What do you need to know? What are the issues? What, what are the legal issues? What, if it's a, um, in a breach of contract case, what are the specific allegations of the breach? If it's a tort case, what are the specific elements that have to be established? If you're a defendant, what defenses are you seeking to raise to try to win the case? And have a plan to make sure that you address all of that to the extent that the witness you are deposing would know that information. And then I encourage all students and young lawyers that I work with then to outline the questions you plan to ask the witness and then try not to use the outline, um, except at various points to orient yourself because the most important and the most effective way to, um, and I'll talk about this in the coming slides, the most effective way to depose somebody and to get the information you need doesn't come in the original question, it comes in listening to the answer and then going wherever that particular answer takes you. So let's talk about that for a minute. What are the common mistakes that New York lawyers make in taking depositions? First, they fail often to clarify the testimony. Um, and in failing to clarify the testimony, often that can come in in situations where um, the witness is making estimates. The witness is using head nods and hand gestures instead of answer, answering verbally. Um, or um, using only verbal descriptions when the witness could actually draw or illustrate something. So I was once involved in a, in a case where a lawyer deposed a defendant doctor in a medical negligence case and the doctor was describing a particular procedure um, and used verbal descriptions. It was actually inserting a uh, pacemaker wire into an, an artery and for a heart procedure. And the attorney only asked for verbal descriptions, uh, did not ask the doctor to draw what happened. And then at trial, the doctor's description while matching some of the verbal description, the doctor started to draw what he or she meant, and it did not fit how that questioning attorney had interpreted the verbal description. Folks, if, if a, the old saying, a, a picture paints a thousand words, if you or is worth a thousand words, if you can get a witness to draw or illustrate something for you, uh, do that. Often the witness will try to hedge by saying, well, I'm not much of an artist. Um, and you can just tell them to do their best and, and tell them to draw it. So 
estimates, guesses, you want to clarify those, you want to, you, you can't accept that, you want to nail down verbal descriptions and if possible, have the witness to uh, draw, illustrate something for you. Uh, or you can even take photographs and rather than have them explain verbally what they're saying about the photograph or where they say something happened or where they found something, you could have them draw on the photograph. Making assumptions, horrible thing that, that law students and new lawyers do. Uh, you hear a, a answer to a question and you assume something about that answer, assume what it means, or you jump two or three steps ahead with it instead of asking the follow-up questions to uh, get on the record absolutely the, the next two or three steps that you are assuming. Um, I have done mock depositions with students uh, where I gave them a scenario of something I, of a witness I had deposed in my private practice before I started teaching and then set it up for them to take a mock deposition and often the students would finish in about 20 minutes in taking the deposition and then I would show them the transcript of the deposition I took which took about three hours in 20 minutes and in large part it's because they make assumptions because they don't dig behind what the witness is saying and because they follow an outline and don't listen to the answer and ask the logical follow-up question. Um, I mentioned earlier when somebody was talking about maybe some delaying tactics on the part of a defense counsel or, or opposing counsel, whoever it might be, failing to be diligent in search of an answer. If you have asked a question and you did not get a, a legitimate answer from the witness, ask the question again. Uh, the lawyer may start to object, may claim that that question's been asked and answered. My response to that typically was, I asked the question, but it has not been answered. And I had situations where I asked the same question six or seven times in a row, uh, trying to get the witness to answer. You have to be diligent and you don't have to be belligerent, but you have to be diligent. And you also have to make sure the witness has told you everything about a particular area of testimony. Uh, about what you're questioning them. If you want to know what they witnessed, what they saw, you need to get them to tell you, you need to ask your follow-up questions, and then your last question is, do you remember anything else that you have not told me? Or is there anything else from that day that you can remember? You want to get that closure because if you don't get that closure, you leave the door open to them adding something at trial. And then again, failing to listen. That is the key fundamental question, the, the most common mistake and the worst mistake that uh, law students in, in practicing to take depositions and new lawyers make is that's failing to listen to the witness and uh, um, asking follow-up questions based not on an outline, not on where you think the testimony should go, but on what the witness said, how the witness answered the question, and what uh, issues that answer might raise and what opportunities that answer might raise to give you additional or, or, or for you to find out additional information on behalf of your client. And I think that covers it. <laughs> okay. um, the question is, if an opposing counsel acts inappropriately, besides the objections, what else do you recommend? Can you call off the deposition because of misconduct? And I guess I'll take the question one step further. Have you ever walked out of a deposition or had opposing counsel walk out? Or the, the deposed person walk out of the, the deposition? No, I, I never had that happen. I, I was in some that were incredibly contentious. Um, I, if, if students ever doubt, you know, where I come from when I'm in the classroom now, I, I tell them, you know, the reality is that I've been yelled at and Maybe I came close to yelling a couple of times just in the nature of, of, of representing your client. I was in a deposition as a young lawyer where the partner in the firm I was in uh, suspended a deposition to get a judge on the phone to try to deal with something. Um, I have had lawyers try their best to get some of their clients to refuse to answer questions. Um, and I just stayed with it. Now, some of that uh, changes over time. You know, the, the older experienced lawyers, if they sense it's a new lawyer, 
somebody early in the practice, they might take a shot at taking advantage of that and seeing if the lawyer will stand up to them. Um, and there may be some regional differences. You know, I, I don't know whether there's whether it's more collegial in the south than it might be in the north or the west or who knows. But uh, by and large, um, we had I had a few situations where a, a lawyer would instruct a client not to answer. Um, and at that point, you are going to just have to take that to the court after the fact. It's really not worth suspending the deposition. Um, never had a lawyer, you know, threaten me other than just claiming that they thought questioning uh, was inappropriate. Um, and what I would encourage folks to do, if, if you're in that situation, what you want to do is get everything on the record, all right? Uh, if you do have to dispense, suspend the deposition, then you would want to put on the record that make it clear that you plan to go to the court with a motion. You might say that there's, you're going to file a motion seeking sanctions. Sometimes lawyers say that and then they don't seek the sanctions. Um, um, so that if you're on the record and, and put specifically on the record why you think the question is appropriate and why you think you know you're entitled to an answer and if the party is claiming privilege or some other reason somebody should not answer why you feel like the privilege is not being properly asserted. Uh, if you win that motion, then you actually could reconvene the deposition. So the question often becomes after the fact, is it worth, is it worth the fight? I did have a, the closest I came, I did have a lawyer once who, uh, uh, I was trying to get his witness to, to circle something on a photograph, an expert witness uh, to circle something on a photograph about what he was uh, claiming uh, or where he was claiming something happened. And the lawyer, for some reason, didn't want me to do that. He tried to, he stood up, slammed down his computer lid, tried to grab the Sharpie out of my hand. Um, and we took a break and came back. I put my statement on the record. He put his on the record and we, we went on. So uh, part of it is just, is just realizing if you, if you take on this role of litigator, uh, you've got to stand up for your client. You've got to stand your ground. And as with everything we do in the law, always make a record of it if you think you might have to go to the court down the line. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, another question is coming in. Uh, let's see. Um, I'll go ahead and read this one out, Professor Jenkins. If you're preparing to ask questions to the opposing expert, how can you collect an expert's previous depositions and trial testimonies? Do you recommend using any particular searching database? What? In, in the work I did, um, there's a, a trial lawyer's bar and there's a defense lawyer's bar, and both of them have professional organizations that try to share information. And so you do have some databases. Some of them are you know, for fee. They're, they charge a fee to obtain uh, prior depositions. Uh, with the internet now, there are obviously other resources, and, and sometimes you can find it, maybe not depositions, but maybe find expert reports as part of a court file in you know, a, a Westlaw or, or, or whatever other database you're using. But you're not limited to that either. There were, there were times that I would, uh, I would just search for a similar case, not necessarily in my jurisdiction, but a, a similar case in terms of the facts and what happened. If I could find a reported case in a in a from a uh, either a federal district court or from a, a court of appeals in another state, uh, it wasn't uncommon for me to call the lawyer who handled that case and ask the lawyer directly if they had any depositions that they might be able to share. Unless, as part of a settlement, the file was sealed or there was some kind of non-disclosure agreement as part of a settlement. I found that lawyers would often do that, and of course, I started I started practicing in the Stone Age when we had to send everybody that stuff hard copy. <laughs> it's, it's so easy now <laughs> just, to, it went, just to send the electronic version of it. So sometimes you have to go out there and dig. You have to, or you know, ask lawyers in in you know at bar meetings. Are you familiar with anybody ever handling a case like this? And it is amazing how attorneys, uh, particularly attorneys who focus their practice on one side or the other are willing to help each other as long as their case is completed and there's no 
nothing about the settlement that will prevent it. So there are some databases out there. The most, the best ones I'm aware of are through the professional organizations that accompany the work you do. And then sometimes it's just your creativity and trying to find a similar case and uh, find a lawyer who has handled a similar case. Uh, the, uh, what is it? And that's the American Association for Justice now. They have a, a National Association of Trial Lawyers. They have an extensive database, uh, some of it for fee. So there are opportunities for that out there. It, it, the one caveat to that is it, it at times can be difficult. You can find prior expert testimony, but sometimes it is difficult to find a prior deposition that is addressing the exact same issue that you're addressing. The expert may have opined in other areas, but it will not be the area in which you're addressing. And if that's the case, you may only be able to get so far with anything of, with any effective use of the deposition. Thank you. That right. question. And actually, Professor Jenkins, you mentioned about um, professional and trade organizations. Are there any organizations you would recommend to participants today who might have an interest in the field of civil litigation or learning more? Well, my again, my my practice was all civil litigation, and almost exclusively on the plaintiff side. Um, and there is the uh, AAJ, the American Association for Justice. And there are, um, um, each state has its own chapter in that. Most of those, uh, at least I know the one in North Carolina, will uh, give free uh, membership to a law student. And they will give, um, uh, if not free, I think they have a special law student rate for any CLEs. My, my third year of law school, I started to attend some, you know, CLEs. Uh, given for trial lawyer groups just to go ahead and acquaint myself with the way that trial lawyers think about it as opposed to you know, law students and law professors think about uh, these issues. So uh, if you think you have an interest in litigation, uh, because my practice was on the plaintiff side, I, I can't give you as many details about, uh, I know there's a National Defense Lawyers Association, uh, I know there are state chapters of that. Um, the American Bar Association has a litigation section. It tends to be uh, more general information as opposed to you know, a plaintiff's bar or defense bar and the organizations I was talking about. But I utilize a lot of uh, the ABA information um, in my uh, in my courses. And so uh, all of those, but again, if you think you have an issue, I would encourage you to expose yourself to some lawyers who litigate to expose yourself to some continuing legal education seminars um, geared toward lawyers and for lawyers to to get out of the law law school perspective and see what you think of it in context. That's wonderful. Thank you. And I know there's another question that came in, but if I can just comment on that uh, again for any of you who are currently enrolled students, if uh, all. Uh, I won't say all, but I think almost all that I'm aware of that are professional and trade organizations do have either discounted or free membership rates for students and discounted or free uh, participation at continuing legal education events. And I completely agree with Professor Jenkins having practiced at least in the area of immigration law. I would say, you know, when I was, there's something very different than what you get in the classroom and something different that you would get from being able to participate in these organizations and CLE events, and especially for those of you looking for career opportunities, it's never too early um, to start networking. Said that, another question has come in. Um, actually, a couple more questions, Professor Jenkins. Um, let, let's go ahead and go with the first one. Okay, after a number of depositions, um, in your experience, has the information that you've gotten from those depositions been enough to predict the outcome at a prospective trial? Uh, and the follow-up question is, that way, you know, depending on what comes out in a deposition, are you able to counsel a client one way or another regarding maybe settling uh, before going to trial? Certainly, the, that part of the discovery process, uh, again, I reiterate that I, I think depositions are, are far and away the most important, and they certainly do impact how you view potential success at trial. Every lawyer who's uh, who represented plaintiffs, as I did over the years, had a um, 
case that after the plaintiff was deposed, they were more likely to lose. <laughs> so, so it's not always positive. Sometimes it's negative. Sometimes what your own client says at deposition could negatively impact the case. Um, again, how the experts come across and how strong they are if you depose all of the experts. So absolutely, the um, depositions are a huge factor in assessing uh, settlement considerations, you know, value of a case in terms of obviously the U.S. system is all based on monetary payment. And but absolutely predicting the outcome of a trial, I don't know anybody who has significant experience trying cases who can tell you who knows what a jury is going to do. So you can have an educated guess, but all of us who did this stuff for a long time, that educated guess didn't necessarily pan out at times. So uh, it absolutely is a huge part of, of deciding how to deal with a case, uh, whether to go to trial, what the settlement value of a case is, uh, likelihood of success at trial, but anything that if you try to tell a client that based on these depositions, we will or we won't win, uh, just can't do that. Almost, almost impossible. Excellent. And it looks like one final question, because um, I know we've gone over our allotted hour. Uh, what is the average cost of a deposition uh, or an approximate cost? You know, it, again, that very because depositions is going to be based upon essentially the time. I mean, I think the, the stenographers are going to do it probably by the word or by the page as to so, you know, if you if it's a uh, less involved case and you depose somebody for an hour and a half and you don't video the deposition. I don't know. It might be three or four hundred dollars, depending upon where you are. Uh, if you go four or five hours and also video it, then like I said, it might go two thousand, twenty five hundred, maybe even three thousand dollars, depending upon. And again, if you're deposing an expert witness, you have to pay that expert for his or her time in deposition. So if you take a three hour deposition of an expert and that expert is charging $500 per hour, well, you'd have to pay the expert $1,500 for her time and then the time for the transcript and you probably would have videoed that deposition. And so that single deposition alone could, you know, potentially be $4,000 plus. Uh, Litigation is expensive. Our our system, we in the United States, we there's discussion all the time about access to the medical system and medical care and how expensive that is in the United States and tremendous debates about that. Unfortunately, we talk very little about how expensive the legal system is, particularly going into court. Um, and it is expensive. Uh, it shouldn't be that expensive to seek justice, but it is hopefully maybe over time. Uh, some of you can help do something about that, but uh, it is a major consideration. I um, We went to a uh, start a trial one Monday morning in eastern North Carolina when I was practicing and uh, plaintiff's lawyers by the nature of our system can invest in the cases. They, they can invest to the extent you can front the money the litigation costs on behalf of your client, and you can recover those out of the proceeds of the, the case. Um, and we had, a, my law firm had $120,000 of our money invested in that case. Um, um, I, I laugh, I tell, I tell every class I teach, now they know why I'm teaching, because you only have to go to trial with that much money on the line three times, and you start to say, maybe there's a better way. but. Uh, if the case is involved, if there's significant money involved, and if there are big issues involved, I think the most honest answer is there is very little way to hold the cost down. It's going to be expensive. It's going to be expensive to litigate. That's just the nature of our system. Thank you, Professor Jenkins. Um, as we work through the last few slides, if any of you have any final questions, feel free. You can use the chat feature or you can ask us as well. Um, I've included our contact information here for members of the LLM team if you have any questions. And then for Professor Jenkins, we'll also email out after the event his email address, but it is actually 
rjenkins at charlottelaw.edu, but we'll send that out to everyone as well if you have questions after today's event. In addition, if you want to learn more about our online LLM programs, we've included links here, and please join us on our Facebook page as well. We always have information about upcoming events. Actually, this Wednesday on campus, we have an excellent presentation on Islamophobia, so for any of you who are in driving distance of the area, we invite you to join us for that excellent event. Um,